Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our first formal event of the semester and for the academic year. And it's my particular pleasure to welcome Kristen Collins. Before I go into introductions, my name is of Kristen. My name is Patsy Lewis, and I'm the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies located in the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. Kristen Collins, Dr. Collins, is a postdoctoral fellow located at Clax. And she is here as part of the Sawyer Seminar on Migration, Mela Sawyer Seminar on Migration, entitled Rethinking the Dynamic Interplay of Migration, Race, and Ethnicity in the Caribbean and Latin America, which Clax is very happy to um, co-host with the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice and Africana Studies Department. Of course, migration is one of the big issues of our day. Um, there are lots of big issues of our day, but migration is certainly one of them. And our series of events around the Sawyer Seminar um, are meant to shift the focus of the conversation from the US-Mexican border to look more at the experience of migrants within Latin America and the Caribbean um, from a multi-dimensional uh, perspective. So we're very happy to have Kristen start the ball rolling. Kristen's, Kristen earned her MA and PhD in Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at the Ohio State University and her BA in Philosophy at John Carroll University in Cleveland, Ohio. Her research focuses on resistance to state violence, Central American social movements, migration and the transformative potential of everyday practices through the lens of decolonial and transnational feminisms. She is currently working on her book manuscript, an analysis of the transnational movements and community building practices of Central Americans subjected to forced migration, dangerous crossing conditions and confinement. In her work, she takes an interdisciplinary method a lot method methodological approach that combines ethnographic methods, her own activist practice and dance studies. The project bridges the fields of Latin American and Latinx studies, bringing together research conducted in Guatemala, the Sonoran Desert, and the immigrant justice movements in the US. The project's goal is to document the transformative possibilities that emerge from Central America's everyday practices of coping with loss, distance and violence and to theorize transnational belonging to resistance to white supremacy. Her, the title of her presentation today is Presence Work, Temporal Violence and the Activist Rhythms on the Sonoran Migrant Trails. I now invite Dr. Collins to speak. She will speak for around half an hour, after which um, we will have a discussion with her. Please raise your questions and pose your comments in the Q&A function. You don't have to wait until she has finished. You can do this as the talk progresses. Thank you. And welcome to you all, Kristen. Thank you so much, Patsy. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to talk about my work today. Um, but I also wanna say thanks to uh, Kate Goldman and all the other folks who, um, who made this Zoom possible. Um, I think it's really important to recognize that work because we're, when we're all on the screen, we can kind of feel like it just happens, but actually a lot of people made this possible. And also big thanks to Patsy for her leadership at last, or at Clax and um, the Sawyer Seminar and all these things that have made it so I can be here. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that you can see my presentation. All right. So um, what I'm going to share with y'all today is a piece of my book project. Um, and we already heard a little bit about this, but I just want to um, kind of go over it again that 
The project analyzes transnational movements and community building practices of Central Americans who are subjected to restricted mobility. The project also documents transformative possibilities that emerge through everyday practices of connecting across the distances created by confinement. In the project, I center forced migration in Central America alongside another case, the Hogar Seguro Virgen de la Asuncion tragedy that happened in Guatemala. In 2017, it was a fire that killed 41 teenage girls and permanently injured 15 more at a state-run facility for minors um, who were encountering high risk in their home situations. Um, so I'm not gonna talk so much about that today, but um, I situate forced migrations and that case as both emblematic examples of contemporary necropolitical governance um, examples of the use of carceral security solutions and of restricted mobility. Uh, the book project, it refracts the theories of racialized state violence through the lens of queer and feminist organizing to understand colonial logics that generate separation across time and space. At the center of the analysis is the weaponization of time, or what I call temporal violence, a strategy of contemporary governance that comes into focus by studying activist rituals, repetitive cycling encounters, and the time bending relations with the dead and the disappeared of racialized state violence. And so this larger project is interdisciplinary, uh, intersecting the fields of Latin American, Latin, Latinx studies, uh, transnational and decolonial feminist theory, queer studies, performance studies, and it also draws on the work of anthropologists and sociologists who study migration. So uh, the piece of the project um, that I'm gonna talk about today. It began when I was out too late in the central park of Guatemala City. I was at a Maya ceremony lit to call justice in the names of the 41 teenage girls who were killed too soon by a fire at the Hogar Seguro Virgen de la Asuncion. While I stood with a small group of activists around the ceremonial fire late into the night, it was almost exactly three years ago, a dispersed group of young men with small packs walked across the plaza. They kept their distance from us and from each other. They were only looking down at their steps as they made their way through the barely lit and nearly abandoned public square. You can see a view of it right now. So keeping a steady pace, they walked past the presidential palace and beyond my line of sight. When the ceremony ended, those of us who remained talked about noticing the men move across the park. Their clothing, backpacks, and the space they kept between one another set them apart from others who crossed the plaza that night who were probably leaving the nearby bars. A person in our group speculated that the men might be migrants, maybe Salvadorans or Hondurans, on an early leg of their journey north. And I knew then that Guatemala is a transit country for migrants from all over Latin America and the Caribbean, but that was the first time that I perceive migrant transit, that it registered to me as something that was out of place, or maybe I should say that it was out of time. So whether their destination was the US or Mexico or really just anywhere beyond the park, the men were out of place. They were passing at the wrong time. The timing of their footsteps registered to all of us at the fire as a violation of norms, a reason to question their presence in the park and speculate that these men don't make their homes here. And my talk today is about these assumptions and the ways that chrononormativity, a concept theorized by Elizabeth Freeman, can help us understand how the most marginalized border crossers become targets of violence in the Sonoran Desert or in any space of transit. I'll offer a critical reflection on a short time I spent accompanying aid workers who maintain a steady presence in sites of migrant transit to argue that their dedicated repetitive work generates a rhythm that violates the rules of chrononormativity and stands to disrupt the temporal violence that determines who and when bodies may move through spaces used for migrant transit. So this image that you see now is a kind of a map through the pieces of what I prepared for today. Um, in keeping with the epistemological challenge embedded in critiquing linear time, my map sits on a circle. I encourage you and myself to think of these pieces as interwoven rather than strictly sequential. So to set the stage, I'll start with the desert. Uh, by this time, the risk of irregular border crossing is well known. For some of us, this knowledge comes from reading books and newspapers, witnessing first and secondhand accounts, and even visiting the sites where others encounter risk. This is my experience. This is how I know about these things. For others of us, 
The knowledge is more intimate from having undertaken the journey to waiting for calls or texts from family or friends who are in active transit. When I went to the desert in the summer of 2019, I was there to learn by visiting. I applied and was accepted by the No More Deaths organization based in Tucson, Arizona. I, I was to join them as a short-term volunteer. As their name suggests, No More Death works to bring an end to death and suffering in the borderlands around Tucson. Powered largely by volunteers, they engage in a really wide range of projects uh, that they document the abuse of migrants, they provide aid to folks who are preparing to cross, they facilitate legal clinics, um, and they mobilize search teams when border crossers go missing. And on top of all these projects, No More Death's strongest commitment is to the maintenance of what they call a constant humanitarian presence in areas of the U.S. Sonoran Desert. Uh, and these are the places where border crossers are known to travel. Maintaining this presence involves facilitating regular groups of hikers who carry fresh water, food, and supplies, like socks and blankets. Uh, they carry them to designated drop sites on active remote crossing routes. Uh, the members of the hiking groups rotate, allowing new short-term volunteers like me to join longer-term members who um, have more experience navigating the desert and interpreting the signs left by passing border crossers. So to do this work, No More Deaths maintains two camps, each around two hours in opposite directions of Tucson, where volunteers provide first aid to crossers and where we sleep, eat, and plan between hikes. Um, and both of these camps have been repeatedly raided by the Border Patrol. My time in the desert was structured almost completely around coordinating water drops. And before I was able to begin accompanying the process, I attended an orientation session uh, hosted by a long-term volunteer named Jo. She first gave us practical information about staying at the camps and accompanying the water drops. And then Jo talked to us, uh, she talked us through the possibilities um, of how we may encounter border crossers while hiking the desert. And so Joe explained that it was most likely that um, we wouldn't ever encounter anyone face to face. Um, most crossing activity happens at night um, and folks take advantage of cooler temperatures and the cover of darkness. But in the very improbable event of an encounter, we should expect the crossers to hide or run away um, in an exercise of very prudent distrust, or we should prepare to just hang back and let more experienced volunteers take the lead. This was a quick explanation and Joe moved quickly on to a much more likely event, what to do if we find human remains. Because of the United States federal immigration policy called prevention through deterrence, the desert has been engineered into a weapon against undocumented migration and we are much more likely to encounter a dead body than a living person. Joe was right that I would not see a border crosser face to face while hiking and luckily I also didn't encounter human remains that I know of. However, the possibility of this direct confrontation uh, hung heavy over my time in the desert. So prevention through deterrence or PTD has been widely studied and analyzed by scholars across disciplines. Um, on the slide here, you can see some texts that have been most useful to me in my understanding. And I'm just gonna give kind of a brief overview of how I'm looking at PTD. So in the mid nineties, the Clinton administration uh, implemented PTD, um, which is a strategy that initiated the federal government's weaponization of the borderlands desert regions. The 1994 strategic plan for the Border Patrol describes PTD as a system of enforcement that will increase agent presence and technological intervention to bring the apprehension rate of unauthorized crossers to 100%. The plan includes among its assumptions that quote from the Border Patrol, uh, that violence will increase as effects of strategy are felt. So beginning with strategies like Operation Gatekeeper in California and Operation Safeguard in Arizona, this new agent technology after apparatus obstructed heavily transited routes through urban areas and funneled crossers into more remote and less known areas of the borderlands trade. Because of these measures that have only become more severe since 1994, crossers are subjected to longer, less direct journeys through harsher terrain with no access to life-sustaining resources like fresh water, food, shelter, medical, pair, medical care, and really crucially community support. Before the PTD measures, crossers could more accurately calculate the length of their journeys, they could access support and supplies, and they could count on finding places to replenish those resources. 
Now, border crossers must make the days to weeks long journey through extreme temperatures and remote rugged terrain with only as much as they can carry on their backs. Pre-PTD, the journey was so much less difficult that migrant workers often came and went from their communities of origin, crossing the border regularly throughout their lives. So nearly three decades after the initial implementation of PTD, migration routes are as long, remote, and dangerous as they have ever been, which opens the door to more death, disappearance, and abuse by officially sanctioned and unsanctioned actors. The stats collected by uh, Jason De Leon's Undocumented Migrant Project and the Colibri Center for Human Rights, and even the Border Patrol itself, uh, they show an unmistakable trend of increasing migration and increasing death in the decades since PTD's implementation. Anthropologist Robin Reinecke recognizes that these conditions have produced a quote, space of terror, where she says the state nurtures violence against border crossers as a means of bringing the area under control. The roots of these governance strategies run even deeper into our hemispheric histories. Sociologist Igla Martinez Salazar writes that colonial regimes of Central America also use the restriction of urban space to define citizens against less civilized others. So Europeans stole land, built cities, and barred indigenous people from living inside of them. Then the governors become arbiter of who dies for the security of those inside the protected urban space or the sites of consolidating power in the emerging nations. Martinez Salazar recognizes that during that time, Indigenous genocide becomes linked to the duty of the state to designate and protect its citizenry from threatening outsiders. Strategies that push racialized others out and away from cities and naturalize lethal violence for the protection of the citizens, as we of course see in the case of PTD, rely on colonial logic and replicate centuries old race and gender hierarchies. So similarly, political theorist Hagar Kotev writes that under colonial regimes, access to free movement is ordered and conditioned. Only those subjects who appear, quote, stable, or we might say steady in the right place at the right time, only those subjects are able to move freely. Kotev notes that stability is identified by its proximity to whiteness, masculinity, and capital. And all the other movements may be classified as terrorism, which is the ultimate threat to the integrity of the nation. So if we apply Kotev's vocabulary to crossers on the Sonoran trails, migrants become, as Kotev might say, quote, a security hazard to be tightly managed. This makes any violence against them appear justified for the protection of those enjoying freedom within the contemporary national territory. And we can see this discourse applied within the US, but also as enforcement ramps up in Mexico and in Central America. In the desert borderlands, these colonial logics seamlessly justify the operations of necropolitical strategies, which result in ambiguously absent border crossers who may be lost, detained, undocumented elsewhere in the US, or dead in the desert. They're unfindable, out of place, and out of time. The desert works quickly to destroy any evidence that migrating bodies were ever present at all. The traces of crossing are made to disappear from the view of those who look in from the outside. The assemblage of heat, cold, wind, rain, and animal, animal life quickly consume and disperse the remains of life and death. This weaponization of the physical geography is well observed and theorized. What I propose is that prevention through deterrence also weaponizes time. The foundational logic of a system that it achieves prevention through deterrence, future prevention resulting from past deterrence, relies on a tidy thread moving from past to present to future. The bodies that have already been detained or made to die are meant to serve as symbols of danger for those presently deciding to cross, which ultimately delivers a more secure future. Past violence appears in the present only in its figurative capacity to produce a benefit for citizens in the future. Individual desert death and suffering remain relegated to the long, invisible history of disappearance. As a function of governmental necrostrategy, Dead and detained bodies are a tool for the reproduction of state power. The specter of past death serves to regulate bodies in the present and to maintain trust in the state's singular ability to provide for citizen security into the future. This temporal violence follows M. Jackie Alexander's observation of a global system of inequality in which the West dwells in the here and now, while the third world is relegated to a then and there. 
Central American migrants only appear in the present as they decide not to cross, which resonates with Kamala Harris's recent visit to Guatemala when she told her audience, quote, do not come, do not come. The Sonoran Desert, the borderlands that divide this temporal and spatial transnational hierarchy in the Western hemisphere becomes the time and place of confrontation. As migrating bodies cross the dividing line and transgress the hierarchy, they violate temporal norms and state agents who are charged with maintaining the imbalance of power respond to their transgression with violent containment. Crossers embody the then and there of the third world and they're already logically situated in the past, the time of backwardness, uselessness and disposal and far from the place where they belong. This transnational hierarchy justifies anti-immigration policy and state agents actions that deploy lethal violence and technologies of containment to prevent the temporal and spatial invasion, we could say, of poor brown third world bodies into the US. As Jackie Alexander says, time understood as quote, constrictively linear and resolutely hierarchical, end quote, frames the third world lives as wholly incommensurable with the normative ways of being that structure life in the first world. This hierarchy separates the supposedly static, ideologically and economically underdeveloped third world in opposition to the evolving, progressing first world. Similarly, Martinez Alessard identifies the division between the uncivilized, primitive, barbaric indigenous peoples from the, from the civilized proper and developing colonizers. In both cases, those at the top of the hierarchy who grow and improve charge themselves with the duty to control the inferior populations standing in opposition to development because they supposedly threaten progress toward the future. In violation of what Elizabeth Freeman calls chrononormativity, the colonized become the targets of necropolitical governance. And so for Freeman, chrononormativity describes the naturalization and normalization of the ways that institutions bear on human bodies to urge what she would say maximum productivity and to grant privilege to those best positioned to comply with this demand. Further underscoring the power of colonial logic, Freeman explains that a life worth living is only institutionally recognizable in its progress along heterosexist and capitalist timelines. Freeman describes these timelines as, quote, teleological schemes of events or strategies for living, such as marriage, accumulation of health and wealth for the future, reproduction, childbearing, and death and its attendant rituals. So end of the quote. The appropriately paced in time body must produce socioeconomically and ideologically according to heterosexist and capitalist societal norms. In other words, white, straight, and money bodies have access to chrononormative timelines, but brown, queer, and poor bodies do not. And this dichotomy mirrors Kotef's and Martina Salazar. The normative bodies move at the right tempo and at the right time. Racialized bodies will always move too fast, too slow, too soon, or too late. Whether a virtue, a virtue of their deficiency or their excess, border crossers will always be in violation of chrononormativity and subject to the temporal violence of PTD. So I'm gonna shift just a little bit to talk about the humanitarian aid in the desert. And so it's important to find, point out that No More Deaths is a coalition of mostly white US citizens. Um, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but this coalition leverages apparent access to chrononormativity to interrupt temporal violence in the desert and propose less lethal temporalities for crossing. And so now I'm gonna talk, like I said, just a little bit about what that aid actually looks like. So for context, I traveled to Tucson, Arizona in the summer of 2019 for two weeks of hiking with no more deaths. And I spent one week at each of their desert camps, one in Aravaca and one in Ajo that you could see here on the map. My time in the desert, like I said before, is, was all about doing the water drops, um, including the time before and after the day's hike. So if we were preparing or we were resting and recharging. During most days, we would leave camp early in the morning, load up a couple of pickup trucks with water and supplies, and then we would drive anywhere from 15 minutes to two hours uh, to, to start the hike. We found our, our starting points by following handwritten directions and GPS coordinates left by previous hikers. And that was because nearly all of the routes were um, out beyond the range of cell phone reception. Um, and that was first for me. I never actually used a, a GPS that wasn't on my cell phone. And so when we reached the coordinates, uh, 
Uh, we would load up our backpacks with as many gallon jugs as we could carry. We would uh, load up cans of pinto beans, um, things like granola bars and chips, and we would you know, stuff our bags as full as we could carry them. And this was on top of carrying our own food, our own water, uh, and our own first aid. And then we would walk, sometimes to one drop, other times to as many as three water drops, and then we would go back to the truck. Some of the hikes were flat, uh, but most were winding paths that took us up and down the cliffs carved out by the washes, um, or which are dried stream beds that temporarily fill in the afternoon monsoon rains during the wet season. And as I learned about the Sonoran Desert's even terrain, uneven terrain by walking it, I also learned how much my body could carry on flat versus uneven and hilly ground, whether I could pack three or four gallons of water and still make it back to the truck. Um, and from the slight upward and downward inclines to the relatively short but nearly vertical descents into and ascents up from the washes, the terrain totally exhausted my legs, feet, and back. These daytime desert hikes are easily among the most difficult physical activities I've ever accomplished in my life. We navigated the desert hikes much, much like we navigated the road to our starting point with a satellite GPS and written instructions from past volunteers. We also on the trails would look for signs like recently trodden paths and items left behind by border crossers. So those may have been uh, used water bottles, food wrappers, uh, discarded personal items like toothbrushes. Um, seeing these items would reassure me that we were headed in the right direction. Uh, because like I said earlier, most crossers move at night to avoid the visibility in the heat of the day. Um, and so seeing signs of human life on the remote trail that I was on, it encouraged me and it gave me a big sense of relief. And after hours under the desert sun, among the towering saguaro, the barb choya, the spaniel botillo, I welcomed literally any sign that the gallons of water I carried in my back would be found. Uh, those signs were unglamorous. They were dirty, degrading plastics that would have been trashed in any other setting. But instead, they stood for border crosser survival. The increasing density of left items signaled our proximity to the water drop, which was an opportunity to lighten my pack, rest my body. In the final stretch before finding the drop, those old, used, disintegrated things brought such an enormous sense of relief that I felt like someone put their hand under my pack and lifted it up uh, to take the weight off my shoulders. Once we arrived and lowered our packs, we would take inventory of the site. And this was almost always my job because I was the only one who brought pen and paper. And we documented how many of the empty water jugs made brittle by the sun bore the traces of border crossers unscrewing the lid. We documented how many showed signs of animal scratching and packing their way through the plastic. And we checked out if there were any destroyed by border patrol or vigilantes who would slash or stomp them to let the water run out. We also documented the remains of food wrappers, threadbare socks, decomposing backpacks, overworn shoes, and little plastic bottles of alcohol with red caps that I remembered from the neighborhood tiendas when I lived in Guatemala. These items and their relative states of uh, decay and weathering helped us to gauge the activity of each drop site and decide how much water to leave and when to suggest that the next group would return. No More Dust volunteers collectively agreed to leave items, to leave these left items in the desert. We only remove empty water jugs and bean cans when we actively replace them with fresh ones. The left items also allowed us to infer how many crossers may have passed through and how much time they may have spent at the spot that we were at resting or even sleeping before continuing northward. This information is useful for knowing what kind and how many supplies to leave behind. And just as the crossers who had been at the sites knew we had been there by the supplies we left, we knew that they had been there by the traces of their use. And here I want to underscore the intentionality and thoughtfulness that No More Desk volunteers enact in the desert. Elsewhere in the project, I'm not going to talk so much about it today, I discussed the trans-temporal trans or time-crossing relationality that exists between the crossers and the volunteers. But here I'm going to focus on the reverence and care enacted at every job site I visited. Each time we encountered a drop site, the process was so similar that by the end of my experience, it felt more like the repeating performance of a cycling choreography or rituals in observance and anticipation of crossing. Upon arriving, we lowered our packs, took physical inventory, 
of what was, what was there, and we rested and interpreted the traces. We cared for our bodies, eating, drinking, and rationing supplies for the day. Then we unloaded, arranged the, arranged the jugs under milk crates to protect them from the elements, and tucked our offering under a shady spot with just enough visibility to be noticed by crossers, but not too much to call border patrol attention. And as I went through these motions, again and again, multiple times a day, the cycling choreography, the cyclical structure of movement unfolded. Drop packs, take site inventory, rest and recharge, unload and prepare, pack up and leave. The movement structure repeated again and again across drop sites, becoming a cycle with predictable parts and a ritual. My muscles and joints remembered what to do next, and our emotions developed a rhythm with grounding down beats. And now as I think of it, it reminds me of a cumbia. A water drop ritual materialized through a set of embodied movements enacted in coalition, slowly relieving our backs from the weight of our packs, lowering them carefully to the ground to preserve the integrity of the plastic, stand, assess, and observe, find a resting place to sit, process, drink tepid water and share snacks. We unpack the warm, the warm, clear plastic jugs from our packs. We arrange the jugs in neat sets of six so that they fit underneath the milk crates. These spots tucked under the trees, behind the rocks or around the bends in the makeshift trails became sacred places where, as Jackie Alexander might say, the boundaries between here and now and then and there break down into here and there and then and now. This rhythmic cycling ritual and the reverence to the suffering and death that happens on the land turn the drop sites into altars where aid workers and crossers meet but across time and leave traces of our presence. The echoes of our water drop rhythm resonate back and forth to the crossers who have passed and those yet to come. And they tie us up in a trans-temporal coalition for survival in the desert. We are connected to each other through the very basic act of drinking and eating caring for our bodies in small communities and doing so again and again in the tough desert terrain. The rhythm that carried me across and scrambled time the most that gave me the sense of the beat of the rhythm, I heard it most clearly when we would sit down in the hot dirt to write messages on the freshwater jugs uh, before arranging them under the milk crates. We shared a couple of dark colored Sharpie markers among us and took turns marking the jugs with messages. So folks who would write things like vaya con Dios or go with God, que Dios le bendiga, may God bless you, hacia un mundo sin fronteras, a world without borders, or simply agua pura, fresh water. Some volunteers sketch simple landscapes, draw hearts, or mark the outline of a cross. Each message, whether simple or elaborate, utilitarian or artistic, infused a bit of each of us into our collective reconstruction of the altar. I took a no frills approach when it was my turn to with the marker, and I usually chose to write something like Adelante or Agua Pura or both. Looking back, I see that it mattered to me to be honest with my message. I took the practice seriously as a gesture of communication with whoever may encounter the water I carried. I was able to leverage my access to chrononormativity, my ability to be in that place at that time and free from systemic violence and to make the desert a little more livable for those who would cross through it. The fresh water and other crossing resources are essential to the cyclical performance because they are the material markers of presence. And in particular, they mark a cycling persistent non-productive presence. The sites undulate between used and fresh supplies without showing signs of accumulation. The presence we mark is also non-individualistic. The volunteers change and the crossers are almost never the same, but the cycle goes on and on and on. We make altars that operate in a scrambled time toward nowhere except the next cycle of surviving transit. Our ongoing participation in the cycle maintains the other's presence, even when we are temperate, absent from the space, and when the individuals who make up either side of the coalition constantly shift and change. While the volunteers I interacted with would likely not endorse this idea, I observed that much of the day-to-day -day humanitarian aid work in the desert is a performance of this presence work, making the crossers and the forces of resistance to necropolitical governance appear. <laughs> 
I say that the other volunteers would not agree because they strongly believe that the water, food, and other supplies left in the desert are for cross for survival through their journey. And of course, I don't contest this point. If one person encounters water and drinks it, the journey has become more livable. But I argue that the possibilities generated by the rhythms that vibrate across the desert terrain and back and forth through the times of crossing, these possibilities don't rely on whether an individual crosser consumes the water. The connection is too light, too precarious, and it doesn't reflect the impact of all the bodies that constantly inhabit the desert and push on the proliferating technologies of necropolitical governance. As the transnational migration enforcement apparatuses weaponize the desert and its time into a machine for killing or deterring the crossers to come, volunteers and crossers remain in a cycle of preserving life lived on the land and cultivating communities based on care, based on showing up again and again for each other. By leaving behind the remains of crossing, border crossers and volunteers do the work of being present on a terrain engineered to produce death and participate in sustaining the ongoing cycle of living and resisting into a time when there are no more deaths. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I will invite the rest of you to raise your questions in a Q&A function. Um, while you're thinking about it, I have two questions for Kristen to start her off. Um, it's about methodology and how your use of performance and rhythm and you know as thematics for thinking about this experience how do you think it adds to the works to your work what do you want us to take away from looking at it um, through those lenses yeah thank and you so the much other question oh, um, is how your presentation today fits into your broader book project So um, for me, performance studies is essential and the, the frameworks of performance are essential because they help us to focus on the body as a site of knowledge production. And so, so much of the time we're thinking about the ways that um, we like theory is this like documentable archivable thing that um, like endures forever in the library and that the body is this like separate entity that, you know, doesn't really participate in the production of knowledge. And so for me, when I apply this lens of performance, of thinking about the rhythms that our bodies produce and the ways that they resonate out um, into a, the world across bodies, um, that helps me to remember that this is the place where knowledge is produced. That when we're in the desert, like this is the theory of change. This is the way that we help ourselves understand what it means to belong against white supremacy, um, against this immigration carceral complex. Does it also suggest a hopeless element, the repetition? It's as if we're always going to be doing this. It's always going to be here. It's not going to change. I think, you know, could it also be given that kind of um, impression that you may not? Yeah, I, I think it, it certainly could. Um, and I think that there's that, there's sort of like an honesty to that, that this is like, this is the world that we live in. Um, these are, you know, historic issues this and that's why I connect prevention through deterrence to colonial hierarchies of gender and sexuality because and race um, we are going to keep doing this again and again but I think that there's also something liberating in the fact that the practice is every day and the practice is in doing it over and over so I think that um, those those sort of like nodes of hopefulness and hopelessness are kind of are where I situate my work and my thinking and kind of where I think that it is productive to cultivate some ideas about change. Okay, <laughs> thanks. And how does this fit with your broader project? Yeah, so I mentioned sort of at the beginning that the broader project is about um, looking at Central American activism. So when I look at the desert, when I think about transit, it's through the lens of the ways that people are theorizing violence and resisting in Central America. Um, and so the story I told at the beginning about the bodies crossing through the park is uh, like, it's a real thing that happened to me. And it really was that moment was part of um, the connections that I started making to these feminist and queer organizers and the ways that resistances were happening across this whole region. Um, and so one framework I use in the larger project is contemporary Mesoamerica. 
And so I use that as a way to think about the, the Northern Triangle countries, so El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, as kind of is connected in the same ways we might think of a state or a nation as connected. Um, so the Northern Triangle to Mexico and to the, the borderlands in the US and really to the Central American diaspora across the US. Um, and so what I wanna do is sort of think differently about the geographies that draw lines around people um, so that we can think productively and sort of together about the resistances to state violence in the region, um, together with resistances to state violence that are happening in transit and resistances to state violence that are happening within the national ter territory of the US. Thank you. Any questions from our participants? Okay, in the meantime, I, I found your, your discussion and, and, and description of the young men passing through the ceremony while you are having it and the kind of disconnectedness, you know, not really understanding the significance of what's happening, um, the transgressions of moving across such a space at such a time. I found that image very powerful because it conjured up a sense of neatness, a sense of order, even though a sense of disconnection. You talked about them having their backpacks on their, on their backs. You talk about them being together. And there is almost a sense that there is purpose, there's hopefulness, there's a goal in that movement. And then that is contrasted when you get to the border with um, the expectation of dead bodies, which suggests a kind of individual kind of trauma. That, that ends up there, you know, death is a very lonely thing. The discarded water bottles and signs that, you know, these are, I, I found, I don't know if you've made anything of this contrast, but it jumps out to me. Yeah, I'm gonna definitely keep thinking about that, but I'm delighted that that came across, um, even in its sort of tragedy, um, because it is, it is the way that I've perceived it. Um, I think that, the ways that people are thinking about migration before it happens to them are, you know, like very not the ways that it plays out. Um, and transit spaces, I think that, and, and we've been talking about this a lot in the office, that transit spaces, um, we think so much about the, like the desert and the borderline in particular, but transit spaces are all kinds of spaces across the world. Um, and I think that it's productive to think about the ways that being ordered or being alone or kind of like being thrown out with the trash in a certain kind of sense um, can be helpful for us understanding what it means to be in transit and how to kind of cultivate communities of care for those folks that are that are moving in those ways. Okay, thank you. There's a question from Harmony Bench. Thank you so much for this presentation. I'm wondering if you can talk a little about the grounding down beats quote unquote, you are articulating in relation to activist rhythms and what kind of temporality they offer. If temporality is weaponized as chronomativity, how does this rhythm offer something different? So thanks so much for that question. And I think it's important to mention that Harmony Bench is also a huge part of theorizing the grounding down beats. <laughs> so I'm glad that you're pressing me on it. Um, and it's something that I'm hard at work on right now. Um, and I think that I actually didn't share my audio correctly. So you didn't hear um, me sharing my audio, which was a little Zoom faux pas. But anyways, um, the I'm thinking about the grounding down beats, like I said, in connection to cumbia, which um, makes us like it's a way of dancing where you cycle around and it's like this very defined grounding down beat. And so I've been thinking of it in the larger project about anchoring us um, like to a point, but allowing the cycle to happen. Um, again and again and again. And so as we are sort of stuck in the cycle, uh, that doesn't allow the bodies to, in the cycle, to project forward into the progress narrative um, of colonialism, of capitalism. And so as we cycle around, as the grounding downbeat helps us to sort of stick into this cyclical moment, um, I'm seeing it as a way of of theorizing a different kind of temporality. And so in the project, I'm tracking these cyclical temporalities, these sticky grounding downbeats, which are also in connection to sticky hauntings. 
um, how these sorts of things can help us to rehearse the what I'm calling choreographies of change, the ways that we are moving our bodies in opposition to the timelines that have been suggested to us or been enforced upon us um, through colonialism. So it's definitely something that is like very much um, organic at the moment, I guess you could say, um, but I, I really appreciate the question. There's another question from Erica Durante. Um, going back to your understanding of time in the context of the crossing, should we consider the US-Mexico border as a chronotype per se? Um, I'd love to hear more about if you're in person, I say, can you say more about that? Um, and I think that the way that I'm thinking about the US-Mexico border right now um, as, and I think a lot of people are thinking about this way, it's sort of like, it's theorized as sort of like a, like exceptional, it's outside, um, that as, I think that the, these normative sort of ideas aren't necessarily registering. And one thing that I am trying to set up in this paper is that there's a difference between the way that time operates during the day and the ways that time operates at night. Um, there is like in the daytime access to being in the desert for a reason um, as is like marked by the accessibility of being an activist of doing water drops on the land. Um, but as soon as it's night, um, it, it's like no longer kind of following those same sorts of of norms, like there is no real reason to be in the desert at night, you know, if we're thinking kind of normatively about it. Um, so maybe we can talk more about this question. I hope that we can, um, but it's, I'm, uh, I'm excited to think through it a little bit more with you. Okay, um, any more questions for Kristen? Kristen, um, can you tell us more about what happens at the border? I mean, you do the drops were done during the day. Um, why not at night? Is it was it to prevent um, interaction that you know that could be traumatic, dangerous, unsafe? Um, how? What are the chances of interacting with border agents? Because I'm assuming that. If you know that migrants tend to come out at night to get these supplies, that border agents will also know that. I was just wondering, you know, what those interactions might have been like. Yeah, the, we don't go out at night because it's it's dangerous, like physically speaking. Um, I I think I I mentioned this in the talk, but like I didn't know very much about the desert before I went there. I'm like far from an expert on desert terrain, um, but it is. I mean, it, it's incredibly uneven. It's hard to just walk, you know, even just like go for a walk in the desert during the day. Um, so at night, it limits visibility, which benefits people who are trying to hide. But if we don't have to avoid that sort of violent interaction with Border Patrol, um, we increase our own safety by being out during the day. Um, lots of animals live in the desert. Uh, like there's all kinds of things that could happen. And even, you know, there were times when I didn't, feel like particularly safe when we were walking around during the day um, when the rain, when it would start to rain and things like that. Um, so it's definitely a way of like preserving our own sort of physical integrity um, at the time. And I would just mention kind of speaking to the interactions with Border Patrol. Um, one thing that I came to learn about the Border Patrol is that they um, tend to stick around in places where they have cell phone reception, which makes sense because like they want to be connected, but it also sort of opens up um, I guess like a kind of map for us to know, you know, like where they might be. And it helps like volunteers decide where water might go because you don't have to worry so much about hiding things when they're in places that are, you know, tucked far away from the roads um, that are down lower. So they're not getting as much cell phone reception. And that was kind of the biggest mapping tool that was available to us. But then it also, again, like increases the danger of navigating um, because there are no roads there's, you know, there's no anything. And I think I emphasize the, the danger and the difficulty of navigating for me um, because like people are, that are crossing not with an organization and not with satellite GPS and not with like a notebook full of instructions are so much more highly challenged at moving across the train. 
Um, and I had like been working out for a long time to prepare for doing this because it was hard. Um, and people aren't necessarily, you know, crossing the border and understanding that like this, you know, what is required of your physical body in order to move you across this land. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Kate, Kate has her hand up. Kate, you may ask a yeah. question. You may turn on your video and ask a question. As a host, I can't put my question in the chat. So I'm sorry to sort of interrupt. Um, but I was going to say, what about broken bodies? I mean, you've been talking about your physical fitness and the dangers of going out at night or even during the day. And I think folks who are familiar with moving through the desert know that any injury can, you know, be a disaster. Um, how often does that come up? Like, is, are there provisions in your packs? Are there instructions for dealing with injuries? I mean, both for you as volunteers, but I'm mainly thinking of the, the migrants who are moving through these spaces. Yeah. Um, the, so when we go out in our little groups, um, the, the rule is that somebody who has been trained in wilderness first aid is always a part of the group. And so there's always first aid supplies that go out with the group. Um, and that person um, is also kind of responsible if we ever did encounter somebody who needed first aid, you know, and that could sometimes be something as simple as like a band-aid, but could also be something that like, there has to be a conversation about whether or not like an ambulance should be called. Um, and so part of the group also, the, the rule is that somebody else is um, like, speak Spanish fluently to be able to facilitate the conversation. So those are the two sort of, um, I guess, like contingency rules that exist for the, uh, for the groups to function. Um, but I think that it really, in, when something happens, um, and if you don't know, you know, where the car is, like we did, there's really, it's really unlikely that, you know, a first aid kit is going to make a big difference in that situation, um, which are like really scary situations. And that's when you hear about people being left behind um, and people, you know, being in like extreme life-threatening situations. And it can be just as simple as, you know, twisting an ankle or breaking a foot or something like that. But if you can't go on, um, you tend to get left behind. Okay, it's a somber note. Yeah. Do we have any more questions for Christine? Okay, I want to thank Christine very much for a very interesting um, discussion that, you know, stretches me in terms of how I think about, um, you know, how you can represent things that you see primarily through a social sciences lens. So I, I really enjoyed, you know, that aspect of your talk. And I want to thank our participants for coming. I know that, you know, there were some important clashes we didn't realize with faculty board, um, but thank you all for making the time to come. Um, thank you to Kate, Alex, and Alan um, at Calax, Kate at Calax, Alan and Alex at, with the Watson communication team for making this possible. And thank you so very much, Christine for speaking with us today and thank you so yeah. much to everyone